Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben, and if we haven't met before, I'm the student pastor here. And let me just reiterate a warm, warm welcome to the families and friends, our guests tonight. It's so good to have you. Thank you for coming to support our baptism candidates today. Uh, it's been a joy to witness baptisms. Baptisms are a way of expressing that someone has become part of God's spiritual family. So to our uh, baptism candidates, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Um, I think baptism services are pretty great. I mean, what's not to like? We all, we get a huge group together from all across the city and the country. We get to hear great stories. We get to sing. We get to celebrate. And we even get to dunk people in a hot tub in church. I mean, it's amazing. But my favorite thing by far about a baptism service is hearing the testimonies, hearing the stories of people's lives touched by God, Every testimony is unique. You know, some people were raised by Christian parents, some not. Uh, some came to faith gradually. Others came in a decisive moment. But despite all these differences, every story is the same. Every story shares a similarity in that it centers on the same person, Jesus. And I think that when we consider what to talk about at a baptism service, it might be appropriate to think a little bit about this one person who shows up in every testimony. So to do so, we're going to look at uh, this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's a really appropriate text because the author, the Apostle Paul, is giving a really brief summary of his testimony, kind of like we forced the baptism candidates to do in two to three minutes. Paul uh, did it in a very concise way. Now, if you don't know who the Apostle Paul was, he was vehemently anti-Christian. He was a Jew in the first century, and he hated Christ, and he hated people who followed him, and he got Christians arrested and even killed. I assure you, you don't know anyone who's, who is more opposed to Christianity than Paul. But then Paul met the risen Jesus. He experienced God's love and grace, and it radically changed his life and the course of history. Empirical fact. And Paul gives us a summary of the gospel, of this good news, here in this passage. So we're going to look at the whole passage, but we're going to focus on verse 15. So if you look at that with me, if you have the Bibles open, in verse 15 it says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So we're just going to spend our time together looking at this one sentence and thinking about the implications of it. And my proposal is that we do it backwards. So let's begin with the word sinners. I think it's important to begin with the word sinners because sinners is the Bible's diagnosis for the problem, the human experience. But it's also important to begin with the word sinners because I think it's a very unpopular word. Like, I don't know, youth, would you say sinner is an unpopular word here in Cambridge, you know, in the schools, among our friends and neighbors? And why is that? Well, I would hazard a guess that it's because sometimes the word sinner is heard, is understood incorrectly as a label we use, to, the church uses, to condemn others, to say that you're other than, lesser than, unloved or unlovable. But this passage completely refutes that. Because when Paul uses the word sinner, who does he apply it to? Twice, in verses 13 and 15, he applies it to himself. And not only that, he says, I am the worst sinner. It's a word that Christians use to, first and foremost, diagnose ourselves before we even talk about others. Well, what is a sinner? We've heard a little bit about it up on the screens with the baptism liturgy. It was a word reference a few times in, in the uh, stories that we've heard. On one level, on the surface level, sin are the wrong things we do that go against God's standards, the things that hurt other people and wrong God. And that's true. But Scripture is much more profound, has much more complexity than just that. According to Scripture, sin is a problem of the heart. I might put it like this. Sin is the re says that the reason we do wrong things is because we love the wrong things. Sin is that the reason we do wrong things is because we love the wrong things. Sin is our proclivity to find our lives joy and meaning and purpose and identity and created things and things of this world rather than finding them in God. Rather than giving God our love and our trust and our obedience that he as our creator, as the good God of the universe deserves. 
And I'm gonna, I want to pick on Daniel because I, I mentor him and I can do that. But in, in his testimony, when he talks about, uh, and, and I just really appreciate his honesty, when Daniel talks about how he was looking for reciprocal love, you know, Daniel here is sharing that actually what he was, what he was doing was he was setting his heart's joy on receiving reciprocal love from others. That's what his identity depended on, which is why he found life so challenging uh, before finding Jesus and his infinite, gracious love. And every Christian realizes that that's us too, that we have set our heart's joy and meaning in something other than God. But even though we've done that to God, God doesn't give up on us. Because the second thing Paul says is to save. Paul says that we need saving. Now, maybe you're here today, you're a guest, welcome, but you're not a Christian, and you think that this might be a little far-fetched for me to say. In fact, maybe you're, it's insulting to think that you need saving. But I would hazard that it's not just Christians who think that we need saving from setting our heart's joy on created things. I'll give you an example from David Foster Wallace, who was the author of Infinite Jest, who was not a Christian, and he recognized that everyone is going to worship something. I'll put a quote up on the screen for you to follow with. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. We can just follow along. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. Great, there it is. Thank you. What David Foster Wallace is saying is that everyone, whether you believe in God or not, worship something because all of us are going to center our heart's joy and meaning on something or some things or someone. But then Wallace goes on to say this. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Or worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And then when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Or, this is Cambridge after all, worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. So what do Wallace and the Apostle Paul both see. They both see that as humans, we put things at the center of our locus of meaning that we look to for our identity. And whatever that thing is, we will serve. It will become our master because it will set the standards by which we judge ourselves. Are you smart enough? Are you beautiful enough? Are you successful enough? Are you, are you the most successful person in the room or, or has some other person in the class or person at work out, outshown you? I, I appreciate and, and Emma's testimony. She talks about how when God began to redeem her life story, she said that God told me that I was loved and intrinsically valuable. And then she lists the things that she would have been looking to, or had been looking to, but that she doesn't have to anymore. Not by virtue, the good things she's done. Not by what I've achieved or will ever achieve. Or how I look. But because of what Christ has done. The problem is that we were made for God. And Letitia said this so well too. She said when she turned 15, she began to feel a sudden emptiness. Like a big part of myself was missing. That's not surprising. Paul would say, yes, that's what I'm trying to get at, that we were made for God, and when we try and fill our heart's longing something else, they can't satisfy us. But here's the good news. Christ Jesus came into the world. A quick history lesson for the youth, although some people in this room would have been alive during this time, so maybe I shouldn't say history lesson, I don't know. But uh, does anyone know who Yuri Gagarin was? Oh, I see a few head nods. Yes, yes. <laughs> in the 1960s, for those who don't know, there was a big space race between America and Russia to see who they could get the first cosmonaut into space. And Russia won. And uh, this was the cosmonaut who got into space first. And when he came back down and landed, like, and he walked out, 
He said, my atheism has been confirmed because I went into the heavens and I didn't see God there. Now, C.S. Lewis was alive at the time, and he wrote a response and said, uh, you really don't understand much about God, do you? Because God doesn't relate to us like someone living on the third floor above someone on the second floor. But he relates to us in the same way that Hamlet would relate to Shakespeare. Well, maybe you know, uh, maybe you know the 20th century author Dorothy Sayers. She was one of the first women to graduate from the other place. And she wrote mystery novels. <laughs> and she's really well known for a set of mystery novels based on Lord Peter Whimsey. Whimsey was an amateur detective who solved mysteries. And he was pretty good at it and, you know, a good series of books. But over the series, he, he got lonely. He was a bachelor. And, you know, he felt like he was missing something. Well, at about halfway through this series, a new character arrives on the scene named Harriet Vane. Harriet Vane, as the story goes on, come, come to find out her, a bit about who she is, she was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford. She also wrote mystery novels. I don't know if that reminds you of anyone. <laughs> yeah, the point is that Dorothy Sayers looked at Peter Whimsey, looked into this like, character she had made, this world she had made, and she loved him and saw what he needed. And she wrote herself into the story, and they fell in love, and they got married, and she saved him. Now, that's pretty romantic. I know my wife Hope would, would like that. But it's just a dim echo of what God has actually done in history. When Paul says in, here in verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world, he literally means that God wrote himself into history. Paul's saying that God, the God who created the universe— looked in, saw that we had turned away from him. And rather than just giving up on us and starting over, he wrote himself in so that he could love us and love us back to him. And why did, Jesus, why did God come in the flesh? Why did Jesus' arrival matter? Well, in verse 14, I mean, Paul is really pithy here, but he says, the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And I think that gives us a little window in, if I could just expand what he's getting at. He's saying that Jesus came as a human to live a life of faith and love. Faith in God, to believe what God said about himself, and to set his heart's deepest affection and joy and locus on God. And love, a lifestyle with others that flowed out of that relationship with the God of love. So Jesus lived this perfect life without sin or selfishness. And he was perfectly acceptable to God. And Jesus wanted to give us that acceptance. But the problem is that we're sinners. We have this bent and proclivity to love other things. And by doing so, we hurt each other and we hurt God. And that warrants separation from God. And this is the scandal of the cross. That when Jesus chose to die on the cross, he gave to all those who would believe in him his acceptance, and he took the separation from God that our, not just the things we do, our sins, but our sinful heart and bent deserves. And Jesus' resurrection is important because it vindicates that it's true and it's accomplished. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus that we're, each of these stories that we heard on stage is celebrating. You know, if I could just say, it's that we're far more sinful than we ever thought, but we're far more loved than we ever dared hope. And just as I come to a close, what does that mean for us? I think there's two things in this passage that Paul tells us it means for us going forward. The first is that this is news worth dying for. This is good news worth dying to self. We see this in verse 16 when Paul says, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Like, notice Paul's incredible willingness to die to his ego and his self-sufficiency and his reputation among others. That's a result of the gospel. Because when someone knows that they're saved through faith, not what they've done, but through faith in Jesus, they know that God has, at the same time, forgiven their sin 
for loving other things rather than loving God, and that God now accepts us, not based on what we've done, but based on what Christ has done for us. That's how we can be made right with the God for whom our heart's longing was made, was literally designed for. And that allows Paul and our baptism candidates and Christians to admit our imperfections and our shortcomings and, and our sins without caring what other people think. In fact, we will gladly do that if the end result is that others can come to see Christ's patience and his love and his grace, because that's what matters. Not my ego, not, not our reputation. And I love how in, in Sharon's testimony, she, she writes that, she just, she just lays it out at the very end. <laughs> she says, I'm not a perfect person, and I get things wrong all the time. Like, no, no mask on here. I, I'm imperfect, but I know a God who cares for me deeply, who died for us, fully knowing that people would reject him, but so that we'd have a chance to choose him. Like, that's the invitation for us. So if you're, if you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, as your King, then can I encourage you to talk to one of these baptism candidates? Ask them more about their story. Ask them why they put their faith in Jesus, even more than what they've shared before. Or you can come talk to Ollie or myself. There's also a book stall that we've curated in the back with some um, biographies of Jesus. Those are free for you to take. There's also some other books. I'd recommend Tim Keller's Making Sense of God, but there's some other great ones back there too, heavily discounted. Um, and we'd love for you just to explore the person of Jesus. So first, this is news worth dying for. But second, this is news worth living for. And we see that in verse 17. Jesus doesn't just save us from something. We're saved for something. Paul ends this passage by saying, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul's so caught up in God's incredible love that he burst out into spontaneous worship. And this is the life that Jesus saved Paul and that he saved every Christian for. When he writes now to the king, be honor and glory forever and ever, Paul is saying that everything we do should be to bring God honor and to give him glory. So when you know, Sophia ends her testimony by saying, he has restored so much within my life and he is the one that deserves the glory, what Sophia is getting at, what Paul is getting at is that our lives are now for something. There's a purpose even greater than us, and that's to bring honor and glory to the God of the universe, who's not just going to exist with this earth or this solar system or this galaxy, but who's forever. And when we're in Christ, we get to enjoy in a personal relationship with forever. So our lives are now full of this meaning that suffering and even death can't take away. If you want real freedom, if you want real purpose, look no further than Jesus. And this comes when we turn away from setting our heart's joy and purpose on things of this world, and instead we love and we trust and we obey God, the one for whom we were made. So friends, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save people like me and people like you because of his great love for us and to give us a life worth living and dying for. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news that you have come near, that you've saved us through faith in your son, and that now we can live a life worth living and dying for. And I just pray for anyone here who doesn't know that, that you would um, give them a curiosity to want to know more. And we pray that we'd have many more baptisms to celebrate people um, rejoicing in this good news and becoming part of your family. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.